I'm Graham Bell. Um, I, I'm an author, uh, I'm a teacher, I'm a gardener. Um, <clears throat> I've had a magnificent career, um, a career in the sense of <laughs> traveling from one place to another and going around lots of bends, I suppose, and, and I've done a lot of different things in my life. Um, we're in our garden here in Coldstream, where I live with my wife Nancy. Um, um, our two children, Sandy and Ruby, um, grew up here. Um, they were both born at home. Uh, my son in the building just behind me here, uh, my daughter in London just before we moved here in 1988. Um, uh, she now has a five-year-old son of her own. Uh, and uh, Sandy is a member of the uh, is a trustee of the Permaculture Association at the ripe old age of 26. So, you know, one way or another they've been a very big part of our journey here. Um, this garden was started 26 years ago. Um, there basically was pretty much nothing but a flat field with weeds in here at the time. And now it's um, said to be the oldest intentional food forest garden in Britain. Um, I'm always intrigued by the fact that people talk about going outdoors when they're in the house, as if indoors is where we come from. But of course where we come from is outdoors. And what Building Buildings does is it enables us to extend our level of comfort uh, and our resources um, across the colder seasons of the year. I personally wouldn't want to live outdoors all of the time, but I know people who have and do. Um, uh, and the point I'm making really is that this is a living room. It's part of the house. The house and the garden are not two different things. Um, this garden is 800 square meters, that's 0.08 of a hectare, uh, and in old money that's one fifth of an acre. Um, yields here are quite variable, but we measure everything we pick, and last year this garden yielded 1.25 metric tons of food. It also produced 500 trees for sale, and about 5,000 plants for sale. Um, in our nursery business and half our electricity from solar panels in the garden and all our firewood um, plus it was an educational resource that over a thousand people visited last year and every year um, so it, it's hugely important as you know we're getting older of course, we're all getting older. It's just some of us started before others. <laughs> and in our case, I think one of the feelings I have about this garden is that we're a kind of legacy period. We're, we're very keen to share this information, knowledge, beauty, experience with as many people as possible whilst we're still able to. And so, um, yeah, the garden is very dear to me um, uh, and to all our family. In fact, our children have told us we're not allowed to sell the house. <laughs> um, although, how, whether they're going to fight over it between them or not, I don't know. Um, but I used to say the furthest anybody had come here for an open day to see the garden was from Perth. Perth, Western Australia. Which was in fact true. Um, somebody did actually ring me up from Perth and say, I'm going to be in Glasgow next week. Do you mind if I come and see your garden? And uh, and did. Um, but in fact in the last year we've had people from South Island New Zealand. We've had people here from uh, Samoa. We've had people here from Vancouver. Uh, we've had people here from Brazil. You know people really do come from all over the world to see this garden. Uh, and um, as a consequence of this experience I which is really our expression of what permaculture is at a garden scale. Um, 
I wrote two books, one called The Permaculture Way, which um, was a general attempt to translate um, Bill Mollison's designer's manual into something a lot more accessible and simple, but also um, designed to match the culture as we have it in Northern Europe, uh, which is different from Australian culture where permaculture originated. And I started to get very frustrated because I was teaching from 1990 onwards, so that's um, 26 years I've been teaching permaculture, because people kept saying, oh, you mean like organic gardening? And I kept saying, no, 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 it's a design system, it's a, it's a way of thinking, it's a way you design anything. Uh, until one day I saw the light and realised that if people wanted it to be about organic gardening, then that's actually a very good gateway. So I wrote the permaculture garden as a way in for people, um, but as you may remember if you've read it, um, the introduction explains that um, it's really about um, the garden as a paradigm, so you could take it as like a parable. So anything that works in a gardening level, you can apply to anything in life. I've been working with computers for at least 45 years. Um, when I started out, uh, we were talking mainframes were all that existed. And um, every night you had to carry a tray of punch cards down to the processing room and give it to the operations guys. And um, if one card was out of order, the whole run got thrown out and you had to sort it all again and take it back the next night. So woe betide anybody who ever dropped a tray because then you had to sit and put all the cards back into order again. And in those days everything was, was in machine code and there were guys, um, so like systems programmers as we would call them today, uh, you always told that you could tell a programmer because they always wore sandals and you could tell a systems programmer because they didn't wear socks either just sandals without the socks and th these guys the, the, they could read punch tape so you'd see them they'd, they'd pull out these, these these strings of tape and they could read because it's all in hex and they could read the hex and translate it into English as they did it um, and so everything was incredibly compact because um, memory was incredibly expensive. And then it's just this constant geometric growth we've had ever since. So a lot of today's software is incredibly inefficient uh, and it's got a lot of dead material in it, redundancies. As things get written out, they don't necessarily get taken out of the code. So things are actually run slower than they would if they were, if we were back in those days um, and I in the 19 late 1970s um, I'd been working in construction um, as a company secretary and I moved into selling computers at the birth of the computer revolution in the city of London uh, and the first things we had to sell were word processors and ICL at the time talked about OPD one per desk a bit laughable now isn't it that was a revolution in those days. Of course, everybody's got a computer now. In fact, most people have got more than one because your phone is a computer, your camera's a computer, your car's a computer. Um, and, you know, I've, I've forgotten more than I ever learned. So I'm, I'm very happy to meet people in the world who've got the technical expertise because I just want something that's easy to work. And we were having a conversation last night about... Uh, some of this stuff as, as well as today about how they keep changing the software and again this is starting to be, get closer and closer together revisions get closer and closer together and it's almost like every time I turn on my computer now they've changed the software again and it's completely impossible for anybody to keep up with this stuff you know you can't be an expert on computers anymore you can only be an expert on a very small part of what it's about so I think we have to be careful that um, computers don't become the enemy, that they don't start controlling our lives, that they 
you know, that we're able to use them in a way that's beneficial. And it doesn't seem to be yet that that promise of the paperless office has happened. Um, you know, if anything, there's more paper than there ever was before because computers can generate more. And it, it, I think what we need to do is strike a balance between them helping us and getting in the way so that they're empowering for everybody, not just for whiz kids who can make them work. Um, so. Interesting. Do you think of any specific ways that computers help permaculture, have helped permaculture? Um, <clears throat> well, they help us um, uh, tabulate and record information. So, you know, here for example, we've got a yield record. Um, a visitor's book is another kind of yield record. Uh, and um, it, it makes it very much easier to sort this information. So, you know, because you can sort it alphabetically or date order, or you can sort it uh, in frequency order and so on. Uh, and they enable you to derive graphics um, much more easily than you could do them by hand. Um, they enable us to be in touch with a lot more people a lot more easily than we ever could do by telephone or mail. So for example we have you know, I don't know 1500 people on our contact database. It takes um, um, as long as it takes to make up a newsletter which is basically just a, a word type document. Um, so you can do that in an hour or two. It takes five minutes to send it to 1500 people and the system just does it for you. And it does it in such a way that it's, um, it takes account of the rece recipient's needs and wishes. So if people don't want to be on the list, they can vote themselves off and it won't let you put them back on. Um, it, did you have to give your contact details? So it's all above board. Um, and uh, but it also tells you exactly what they do with the information when they get it. So it it tells you if they click through to your website, tells you how many times they do it. It tells you you know what time they looked at it. Um, so you get a lot of information back about how people use the information, which is you know, it's a good way of identifying people people's level of interest. Um, and it's an easy way of getting people to feed back. I think the negative side that goes with that is we get far more information than we can possibly process. So, I mean, I typically get 100 emails a day and um, I've had to train myself to get much better at deleting things and just going, making sure they go straight to the dustbin if I don't find them generally useful. Um, but you try to do it without offending anybody, you know, and it's so there's a, a certain courtesy you learn for using the system. <clears throat> um, mostly people respect that, uh, but certainly what you don't want to do is abuse that kind of politeness of using online media. So, welcome to Garden Cottage, um, the oldest intentional food forest garden in Britain. Um, this has been made because we were interested in permaculture and permaculture offers uh, the, the guidance that um, really you want to start with your own life if you want to change the world and, and how you live and what you do. Um, when I was at school we were taught about maths, physics, chemistry, biology. Physics, chemistry, biology is the three sciences and there was always a sense somehow that uh, physics about the properties of the universe, chemistry about how, what it's made of, that somehow these were more important than biology. But the fact of the matter is that biology gives you lessons that go the opposite way to lessons from physics and chemistry because what biology tells you is you can't stop life. Um, if you look at the ground here, this um, paving 
is made of basalt, um, a black rock. It's incredibly hard. It's one of the most inert substances on the planet Earth. And a huge amount of the Earth's crust is made of basalt. It's a, uh, a volcanic rock. But if you come with me, just walk this way. Um, what you see is that at the edge of this hard standing, there's grass, there's dandelions, there's weeds. And they're starting to encroach. Uh, you can see places where mosses are building up. So down here, for example, this is the start of soil. So even on bare rock, you start to get plants growing. Um, there's some little uh, pimpernels and stuff coming here, various weeds. So the question I, I generally ask people is, if you took um, all the sheep and all the people out of Scotland, what would you end up with? Um, and the answer is forest. Um, forest is an interesting word because we tend to think of forests as being trees. And this forest garden has got lots of trees in, as you'll see, but it doesn't mean trees. It comes from the Norman French forest, modern French forêt, which means the king's hunting ground. So before we did agriculture, we were hunter-gatherers, and it's really a legacy of that. And in a way, permaculture is about going back to being hunter-gatherers as much as possible. Um, come and have a look. So this garden was started 26 years ago. It was bare ground, well, not bare, but flat ground with some weeds growing on it. it Garden Cottage was built as a retirement home for the Gilly on the Lees estate, which this is part of originally, um, when he retired in 1948. And he lived here free for the rest of his life, and he, Mr. Taylor was 97 when he died, so he had a good long innings. But because he was getting elderly, they'd stopped gardening. So everything that you see here has happened in the last 26 years. Um, and if we're using the forest as a model, because permaculture is about observing and learning from nature, then the first thing that you'll notice is there are things happening at every different level of the forest. We originally learnt about this from um, a guy called Robert Hart, who lived in Shropshire uh, in his retirement. And Robert Hart had learnt a great deal from, deal from being in India with the great Scottish plant collector, um, Sholto Douglas. And he noticed that, in particular in Kerala province, it's very normal for a family to be able to feed itself from a garden as small as this. This is 800 square metres, that's 0 0.08 of a hectare, or a fifth of an acre. Typically gardens in Kerala province might be a quarter of an acre. They've got some things easier in life because it's tropical, subtropical, so they get three harvests a year. Here we get one main harvest, which is between June and October, and we get things that you can harvest the rest of the year some brassicas, some salads and so on. But the bulk of what we grow here happens in that four month period, midsummer to the autumn. And what Robert noticed is that the forest has, as he put it, seven layers. Climax trees, understory trees, shrubs, herbaceous plants, ground cover plants, things that are mostly root, so bulbs, onions and so on, for example. Uh, climbers, so in a, a typical British forest we would say um, blackberries, for example, or honeysuckle. And um, <clears throat> there's a further layer which is much more common in tropical rainforests than it is 
in a temperate climate called epiphytes. Epiphytes are plants that grow up off the ground on trees. So you might have seen air plants in people's sitting rooms. That's an example. Um, much more common here are things like ferns, mosses, lichens and so on growing up off the ground. We would also add today fungi as a layer in themselves because they're immensely important to how life flourishes in the garden. And I'm actually not certain we're done then because I look at the garden and I see bees pollinating things and I wonder, well, are the bees, and there's a wasp actually over there doing just that job at the moment as well, are, are, are the insects in the garden also a part of its layer? And one of the things you'll notice here all year round is constant birdsong. Um, there are 35 species of bird that nest in this garden. There are 20 that come for their lunch and there's another 20 that come on their holidays. So it's an incredible variety of life, both of invertebrates and, and songbirds here. And that is crucial to why the system works. Just a little further into the garden. Um, you can see areas where it's pretty much left wild. Um, these stitchworts, which are naturally a hedgerow plant, do have any particular uses for people, not that I know of, um, called stitchwork because it looks like the stitching around a buttonhole. Um, these euphorbias, uh, one of the largest plant family, common name spurge, um, <clears throat> not a lot of uses for humans. In fact, the sap is toxic to humans. And if I break a piece off, you'll see you get a, a milky white fluid from it. And this actually burns the skin. So it does have a use because you can use them to remove warts. But that's not why they're here. Um, they're here because all of these things help um, keep insects and birds in place. So what the permaculture message is really is if we want to be sustainable inhabitants of the planet Earth, um, then we need to work less hard and produce less waste. And we talk a lot in the present era about pollution, for example. Um, all pollution is, is assets that are in the wrong place. Something's only a pollutant because we're not reusing it. So what we're trying to do as much as possible in designing a permaculture system is to provide everything we need from the, for the system from within itself and to use everything it produces within itself. So an easy example would be to say, well, composting. If we compost the waste from the garden, that helps build soil and we can reuse it. But you can keep adding things in to the cycle of energy usage. So for example, if you feed your plant waste to your chickens, then you get chickens and eggs as well as the compost because you still get the compost because it comes out the other end of the chicken. And what you're always trying to find is how can I build more yield into the system? So one of the messages here is that true yield is unlimited. You can never get everything that you could out of a system. You can still go to the Amazon rainforest and build more tree houses, find more plants that you can grow there. The same here, there's a constant polyculture of a huge range of plants. Um, and just to give you uh, some little examples, um, strawberries here, naturally growing on the forest edge. Um, <coughs> gooseberries, trained as standards. Um, this bush will produce four kilos of fruit this year. Uh, it's just coming to the end of flowering at the moment. And you can just start to see the small fruits forming where the flowers have been. Um, <clears throat> but because it's a standard, it's much easier to pick the fruit. It's got sharp spines on it, so it's much easier not to prick yourself when you're picking the fruit. Um, because it's up in the air, it doesn't get mildew. And you can use the ground underneath to grow other stuff. Now, a lot of this stuff, if you're not used to it, probably just looks like weeds. And that's exactly what a lot of it is. But every food plant we had was originally a weed. 
So if we just look here, for example, um, we've got um, wild garlic. Um, I've just made <coughs> 20 jars of <coughs> wild garlic pesto over the weekend. This one's uh, a particular allium called Allium triquestrum. It has a three-cornered stem, also known as three-cornered leek. Um, there's ground elder, very invasive weed, but it was actually a gift from the Romans who brought it in as a vegetable. You can use it in salad and spinach. Primroses, the flowers of primroses are edible. Very nice way of brightening up a salad. Over there is garlic mustard. Fantastic burst of flavour in the mouth. Um, we have uh, this plant with the red veins in the leaves here. This is called ruby sorrel. Rubex sanguinea. Very nice in a salad. Doesn't have a very strong taste, but you get these lovely red leaves in the salad. Over behind here, lungwort. Um, we use the flowers in salads. Traditionally, it's a pulmonary. Um, in fact, that's its name, Pulmonaria officinalis, in botanical terms. And that's used, was used, to treat lung conditions. We're constantly learning about the plants here, and um, constantly finding new things that you can do with them. Uh, but there's over 100 fruit trees in this garden, nut trees. This is uh, an apple called Pitmaston Pineapple, originally from Devon. Um, this is part of our nursery stock. These are trees for sale for people. There's red currants coming there. Willow here. Budlier often called butterfly bush here. This is a plum just coming into flower. Well, this is a medlar. Um, Mespulus germanica. Not many people grow medlars these days, but a very nice, slightly astringent fruit. Uh, very popular with Elizabethans. Um, and I sometimes think that we're actually a second lot of the Elizabethans, and will people later on call us that? Um, a lot of Scottish varieties here. This cultivar is called Tower of Glams, um, and the one uh, just here is White Melrose. Um, this was originally came from the monks, Cistercian monks at Melrose Abbey where Robert the Bruce's heart is buried. Um, these logs are growing shiitake mushrooms. Um, we've already had some this year, but uh, these five logs here last season produced three kilos of shiitake mushrooms. I've just planted four more. Um, it's quite a neat way of growing your own mushrooms. <clears throat> this is a quince tree here. <coughs> That'll be coming to blossom soon. Uh, this is an apple tree called Blenheim Orange. Um, that one tree produced 80 kilos of apples last year. And then there are flowers, just because we like flowers. Over here is Magnolia stellata, just over the pond. Uh, we don't have any special uses for it except to admire it. Um, these white flowers down here are ramsons, another kind of wild garlic. Um, nettles, allowed to grow in the garden because nettles are very important food for many of our butterfly and moth species and they're growing in a bed of um, solidago or goldenrod as it's often called um, which is very important because it flowers very late in the summer so it's great for bee fodder for the end of the season you've got to think about what do the insects need to eat and if you are here this time of year and sit and watch you'll notice that the blue tits in particular, but some of the other small songbirds, spend lots of time going along the branches of the trees, nibbling away. And what they're doing is they're eating aphids. So I suggest 
if you don't have aphids in your garden, you've got a problem. Because what are these guys going to eat? What you want is all these things in balance. And that's the importance of having all these species. So I think what we've primarily learned from the garden is if you create the right habitat, the right things happen. And that's true not just of plants but of people as well. If we make the right habitat, the right things happen for everybody. Field beans. Um, this is a fantastic plant, it's just a wild native plant. This is Sweet Sicily. Um, and mm, It's got the most delightful aniseed taste. Um, if you wait till it's got its green seeds on, it's like sweeties. My five-year-old grandson here was on, was here at, at the weekend, and he said, mm, "It's just like sweeties." And he sat and ate a whole plateful of sweet Sicily quite happily. Probably wouldn't eat a plateful of salad, but that's what it is. Potatoes grown in tire towers. We also grow horseradish this way. The little bottle hanging in the tree is um, its a hotel for lacewings. So in the autumn, the lacewings can lay eggs inside the corrugated cardboard. Um, again, just a good bit of habitat. And there's something else that likes to eat aphids. And they're very pretty insects as well. <coughs> Leeks with tulips and strawberries growing amongst them. More leeks here. Pansies growing. Pansies are also edible, nice in a salad. Um, these are various brassicas growing under the fleeces here. That's to keep off pigeons and pheasants, which can be quite destructive of young brassicas. Cabbage family plants. This is a whole different range of onion family plants. Shallots and garlic. Um, some early espaliered apple trees, these are quite young still. Um, this one at the back is called Scotch Dumpling, got a very nice pink blossom on it. Autumn raspberries. Lots more food plants just for the insects. Um, And we even create our own climate. Um, this greenhouse, <coughs> designed by me 20-something uh, years ago, south facing on the glass side, north facing on the shed side. This is a tool shed and workshop. Um, we can bring young plants on here over the winter. <coughs> So um, down here we've got parsnips and carrots being grown in toilet roll liners. They'll be planted out as they are. But what that does is it gives you a month's advantage by bringing them on indoors. You've got some beans there waiting to be planted out. And the guttering here is growing peas. The advantage of this technique is <clears throat> there's lots of mice around here and mice love to take beans and peas. But they don't if you put them out as plants, they only take the seeds. So if you start them off in a guttering like this, you make a trench and you empty it into the trench, again your peas get a start and they're far less likely to get eaten. Um, various other seedlings here, there's globe artichokes over there, um, there's various things coming on in the bed here uh, which will get thinned out and planted out soon. Um, we've just planted the first tomatoes in here which we started off under glass and lettuces. Um, this is an experiment um, and we're always experimenting as is anybody who grows anything you're always experimenting and what you've got here is three grafted tomatoes and three tomatoes of the same variety grown from seed and it's a test to see which do better. Um, you pay obviously you pay a lot more for grafted tomatoes than you do just to buy a packet of seed but um, it is generally said that they are prolific in 
the way they fruit and they fruit earlier so it's to test that theory. Um, passion fruit overhead this passion fruit is um, two years old and it sorry three years old this is and it fruited for the first time last year this is um, Passiflora cerulea as opposed to Passiflora edulis which is the black passion fruit you get in fruit shops here in the UK the Australians call this banana passion fruit um, originally from Central America and there are a number of grapevines in here some of these are for sale but some of them are planted the one at the far end over the doorway there is three years old and last year that had 200 bunches of grapes on it in an unheated greenhouse the same latitude as Alaska not bad <laughs> sorry sorry Lee <laughs> don't run away <laughs> um, <laughs> young peas this is a variety called Gladstone which you can't buy anymore um, so it's a project to preserve the seed variety uh, which is why we're particularly growing them in the greenhouse here so we just keep growing these on and we harvest some every year but we keep a lot to, so we can keep producing the seed but here we are this is um, early May and we've already got peas There are so many productive species and varieties, thousands of them, that um, you can create a polyculture like this very easily, but not instantly. It takes time, it's incremental, and, and good solutions don't happen overnight. It's one of the things that you have to be with permaculture is patient. The yield records for this garden, if you extrapolate them, are about 14 tonnes a hectare. That's more than the farmer gets next door on his huge fields with his John Deere tractors and his 14 furrow plough. And it's just done by hand on a couple of days a week work. These are all soft roots for sale. Solar panels. And even the solar panels collect rainwater into water butts. So everything is put to as many uses as possible. Another principle of permaculture. <clears throat> um, young planting here, carrots, parsnips and leeks interplanted, garlic behind. This is a beautiful angelica just coming into flower. Naturally a seashore plant, nice in salads. And angelica and sweet sicily you can cook with rhubarb and you don't need sugar because they break down the oxalic acid in the rhubarb and stop it being bitter. Field beans, some tail end of some brassicas, some rainbow chard, um, rhubarb artichokes here. Lots of green manures in the garden. This is Russian comfrey. We just keep cutting it to feed the soil. And this is the problem with the garden, I can only ever show you half of it because the most important half is actually under our feet and I can't show you that. It's the living soil is what makes this garden work. So what we spent 26 years doing is building this soil. There'll be two tons of earthworms in this garden. You might have heard of willing workers on organic farms. Um, well, these are the best ones you can get. Two tons of earthworms is, um, that would fill a couple of those dumpy bags that aggregates are delivered in by trucks from builders merchants. Each of those weighs about a ton. Two tons of earthworms is the same as 20 men weighing 100 kilos each. 100 kilos is a fit, strong man. So we try not to dig the garden. Um, sometimes you have to a bit, but Digging eventually destroys the soil structure. So what we're doing here is we're just creating habitat in which earthworms love to be and they dig the soil for us. And unlike volunteers, you don't have to feed them. They don't mess up your bathroom and the living room. 
they don't stop on Saturdays or Sundays. They start whenever they want and they stop whenever they want but they don't go on holiday. They slow down in the winter a bit and they're free. Why would you not want earthworms? Well, if you don't want earthworms, spray chemicals on your land. It kills them. <laughs> Fennel, garlic. Ponds. Uh, useful for wildlife and ducks. We don't have any ducks at the moment. Bit of a duck disaster last year. Combination of weasels and buzzards. And we're going to be going away at some point this year, so we'll restock the ducks when we come back from that. Fabulous pear tree here. This is from the Isle of Wight. It's called Deacons. Uh, produces very reliably every year beautiful red pears. Um, we have Um, we make about 15 cubic metres of compost a year and, um, and then we grow squashes in them. This is a pumpkin. Um, we've just had to take the uh, cloche off it this morning because it's got too hot with the sun today. Um, so it's looking a bit limp. So generally speaking we try not to water them. Um, that will need a bit of a drink. Um, this horseradish growing in tart hours. Marrows growing under cloches. Um, curly kale, sorry, rugged jack kale, this one. Perennial salads here, lots of interesting things. Leaf celery, chives, raw ruby sorrel, Siberian purslane, or Russian purslane it's sometimes called. Um, native in the Scottish Highlands, well, sorry, it's naturalised in the Scottish Highlands. Land cress behind, salad burnet. Just food everywhere you look. Um, we saw some peas in the greenhouse earlier. This is similarly first planting of earlier product. And we'll be putting some more bean towers in there for runner beans. Rhubarb. Um, just coming nicely in the spring. And the, the black. Um, bins are to force it so it brings it on earlier by growing it in the dark. <clears throat> and here we are back at the dining room <laughs> with the caterers. Yeah, we'd, we'd been doing green politics in London and I suppose it seemed to me like we were standing on the off-ramp on a motorway and we were sort of waving at all the traffic st streaming past and saying, slow down, slow down, come this way. And then I suppose at some point we thought, well, instead of telling people to do it, why don't we go this way and stop standing next to the motorway and you know, just go and do it ourselves. And I suppose we came here feeling like we were setting up a demonstration project. But again, as time goes by, I feel less and less like that's what we've done. And nor do I feel the need to do it. I think just looking after yourself and your own is, is a good starting point. And a key ethical principle of permaculture is to share surplus. So by inviting people into the garden, by having open days and so on, it gives us a mechanism whereby we do share the surplus and the share the surplus is you know not just fruit and vegetables and so on it's also it's knowledge and all of that so um, I suppose we created the aspirational future uh, if we were going to do it again I'd do it differently you know there were, we would I would get 15 acres and we would build a house from scratch um, which we nearly did at one point and then you know, we just instead we we rebuilt this building and decided to stay here and 
when our attempt to make an intentional community didn't work out. I suppose we just changed the definition of what our community was, so we made it the community in which we live, the town we live in, rather than, you know, we were going to mark ourselves out as being radically different in some way from other people. Um, I suppose one of the things that came out of doing green politics, um, when I stood in the Greenwich by-election, we, we made a film with STV, um, and uh, there was a guy called Dave Fitzpatrick who lived on the other side of the Thames from us, who, who did scuba diving, and we got him to appear out the River Thames in his kit holding a placard saying vote green, which was quite fun. <laughs> Um, and, uh, and and brave of him because it was blooming cold at the time. <laughs> but I suppose the line that stays with me from that film was, um, <clears throat> the future is green because if it isn't, there won't be a future. And uh, <clears throat> I still feel that. It's not the planet that's at risk, it's people that are at risk. Uh, and the two things that you can do that will change the world the most is to build soil and plant trees. Um, and actually, if we just got on with doing that, we'd be a very long way to solving the problems of the world. Um, and a garden is not a very ambitious thing to do, but it's also not a threatening thing to do. It's, you can stick a fork through your foot, you can hurt yourself in a garden, but actually it's. I think of Gandhi, and he, he used this word ahimsa, which is usually translated as non-violence. But I think it actually means something much more like harmlessness. So that's what gardening is. It's harmlessness. Yeah, there's poisonous things in the garden. You can eat the wrong things and kill yourself here. And yes, you can cut the end off your finger with secateurs. I've done that before. By and large, it's you know, it's these are not world-shattering events. You know, these this it's not like um, the kind of things that we go on seeing in the Arab Spring and so on, where you know the Americans have gone and murdered Gaddafi, and uh, what's that done? Well, it's created anarchy, and uh, it's. You know, whilst you might not have agreed with everything Gaddafi did, he did a lot of good things as well, and um, and that's you know that completely destabilised Libya. We've seen the same thing in Iraq. I mean, you see the tanks driving into Baghdad during both the Gulf Wars, and uh, there are well, the second Gulf War really they didn't get to Baghdad in the first one, but you know they're driving through a desert. This is what was the Tigris Euphrates Delta. It's the birthplace of agriculture, and now it's a desert. Um, Syria was a forest kingdom. It's now largely desert. It's still forest in Syria. It's still forest in in Libya. But the Romans grew most of their grain in Libya. You know, now 20 miles in from the coast, it's the Sahara Desert. So <clears throat> you, if you don't look after topsoil your civilization is uh, somewhat temporary and as Bill Mollison put it um, yeah people who live in the desert off groundwater are temporary residents so you can go down to the Aravar um, north of the Gulf of Eilat stroke um, Aqaba depending whether you're an Arabic speaker or a Hebrew speaker um, and they're, they're keeping cattle in a place with five millimetres of rain a year. And they have to shower them six times a day. And they're using 4,000 year old groundwater to do it. It's crazy. It's just, this is just not sustainable. Um, there are people who live sustainably in the desert. You can see that in Namibia. You can see the Berbers and so on, how they live in the desert. But it's a very low population. Um, and if, you know, if we're talking about peak carbon as being the biggest challenge of our immediate future, then one of the things we have to bear in mind is that 
we are utterly dependent on broad scale agriculture for our food supplies. Um, I say utterly, obviously you can garden, you can grow food like this, but it's very difficult to grow wheat, for example, this way. It's pretty difficult to grow a year's supply of potatoes this way. Um, you know, um, not much good at growing tea, coffee or rice here. You know, so, so do you do what the Fife diet people did and say, OK, we're going to eat everything from Fife except the things that we can't get in Fife, so we'll get them in, that'll be all right, like pepper and coffee and so on. Um, between 1945 and 1975, agricultural production in the UK doubled. So in 30 years, we were growing twice as much food as we had beforehand. In that same period, the agricultural workforce fell by 90%. So that food, twice as much food, was being produced by one-tenth the number of people. So you could say we were 20, 20 times more productive. But it was being done using eight times the carbon cost. And there's also issues about the investment and the way the investment is made. Um, I was talking to an agricultural machinery salesman who told me that the first time he sold a tractor on credit was in 1955 and the last time he sold one for cash was 1975. So we're sending young people to university to learn agriculture and what they're learning is how to do discounted cash flows uh, and how to farm using big kit and chemicals. Well it's not just that the big kit needs carbon, the chemicals also need carbon. You know a lot of the, the, the what we produce to aid fertility is a byproduct of the petroleum industry. Um, so if these things are going to run out, okay maybe we can invent electric tractors but we can't invent electric NPK, so how are we going to grow that quantity of food when peak oil comes along? What are the priorities going to be? Are we going to end subsidy? Are we going to pay the true cost of food? That's what they did in New Zealand. And it's very painful at the time, but the world, their world is much better for it. So peak oil has a very direct relevance to the world's food supply. There is no shortage of food in the world. We've got enough food in the world to feed everybody. It's just not all in the right places. Um, and one of the things to be aware of, I mean, the Indian population is about to overtake the Chinese population. Um, and these guys don't aspire to live by making toys for Western Europeans. You know? They've got, 25 million people at university in China today. Um, these people aspire for their children to have a better future. Um, India has stopped the export of rice apart from Bismati because it's a cash crop. Um, if Indians drank tea at the rate that um, the British or the Arabs do, there wouldn't be any tea left for anybody else in the world. If the Chinese use petrol at the rate the Americans do, there wouldn't be any petrol left for anybody else in the world. And these people are not going to stop their progress, you know, they want the same standard of living that they perceive us as having. Um, and why shouldn't they? Yeah. So, I think it is hugely challenging. Um, I think it's really important that we use the transition period to build the infrastructure in a way that's much more durable. One of the most stupid things we ever did was shutting down the railways. We, we simply cannot afford to rebuild those railways. The cost is phenomenal, but if we don't, we're going to have big problems. The Chinese have already built 6,000 miles of high-speed rail. Um, they're building tunnels through the Alps and buying up Eastern European railway companies because they're going to build railways from China to Western Europe because they know that one day they won't be able to fly anymore. Um, and we're squabbling about building a hundred mile line from London to Birmingham. You know, this is where the future is. Um, we need mass transit systems that work for everybody. Uh, and they're not going to carry on being cars. If we are successful in producing electrical vehicles in any quantity, um, it's not
not going to be the same quantity as petrol powered vehicles that we have at the moment. Um, so there is a whole resource issue about these things and so downscaling our demands are important um, and a lot of what we're doing at the moment is experimental so renewable energy is still very experimental. Uh, I'm passionate about the need for wind farms, solar panels and so on but remember that most of the minerals that are used to make solar panels come from China and these guys are building at a vastly faster rate than we are. Um, so I think we're going to see a massive change in the axis of power in the world. Um, global migrations have always happened. It's a key issue at the moment. The main problem is people having nothing arriving in other people's countries and uh, the sense of alienation that gives people who live in those countries already but we could lose all the immigrants into Europe in Russia quite happily tomorrow. Vast country, vastly underpopulated. Um, don't see President Putin welcoming them just yet. Um, but to put that in context, do you know that Bangladesh has a larger population than Russia? And it's a tiny place compared to uh, the continent. So the opportunities are there, um, it's whether the political will is there um, and <clears throat> I suppose I've done my bit of politics in the world, um, coming back to garden scale is probably more likely to have an effect on what other people can do in their lives than any vote I cast or political speeches I make. So, yeah. The biggest problem we have with politics in this country is that we don't think in long enough timescales. You cannot make these massive changes in the world in five years. And so what we have is constantly we have politicians who are doing things to make sure they get re-elected in five years time. And actually the real results take 20, 30 years to produce. So after 26 years I'm very happy to show off the garden. but. There wouldn't have been much to see after five. Um, this book is um, a modern print, 1990, of um, the origin of permaculture, which is called Permaculture One by David Holmgren and Bill Mollison, um, published in 1978, self-published. Um, the original copy I found was printed on what looked like recycled toilet paper really and uh, it's got these rather basic drawings in it my six-year-old kids could probably have drawn better trees than this um, and this book here um, the Findhorn Garden is a very beautiful book uh, written about the origins of the community at Findhorn and it has amazing black and white photographs in it, beautiful plants and flowers. I, I was staying at a friend's house in Lincolnshire um, when I was doing green politics and she was uh, on the Standing Orders Committee of the, the then Ecology Party with me and with the people who managed to get the name changed to the Green Party way back then. And she went out for the evening and uh, I found these two books on her bookshelf and she left me this flagon of pea pod wine uh, and her library. It was like looking at other people's books. Um, the pea pod wine was pretty disgusting and I later on made some myself which was even worse. Uh, not trying to do that again. Um, but I was struck by this, this beautiful book and the incredibly spiritual thoughts in it. And then I was kind of finding that this, although this book was a bit cheap and cheerful, it was very powerful. And the distinction was, I think, that, that um, I couldn't see from the Findhorn Garden how I could do what they had done. Because the plant divas didn't talk to me. Um, 
as they did to Dorothy at Fintorn. But I could see how I could do this stuff. And it was the first place I'd found that brought together all the things I was interested in aquaculture, agriculture, forestry, um, working with nature, um, the climate, working with the climate, build yourself a multi-use stove. Um, and so uh, with Nancy, my wife, we went off on a weekend course, the first in Britain, and then after that we went on a two-week course in 1988 in Devon, and moved to Scotland so we could do this stuff. Um, still learning about it. Try to help other people learn about it. Um, I'm sure there's a whole generation of people coming after us who will do this much more completely and much better than we've done. Um, but somebody had to start. Um, and that's how we ended up. Practical solutions, things that you could do. Um, plants do talk to me now. <laughs>